Welcome to r slash Entitled People, where we share stories from your lives about people who think the rules don't apply to them and they should get what they want. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, you are denied. Please read the terms and conditions of the contract more carefully in the future. The second story, a long time regular customer was saying mean things to me and about me every shift. The GM finally kicked him out. The third story, lab company screwed itself over with poor management. The first story is, you're the one who negotiated the contract. You made the cutoff date. And you're the one yelling at me on the phone because you're mad I'm abiding by the contract you made? I hate wedding blocks with a burning effing passion. Noisy, drunk, and entitled. That's what the majority of them are. Loud, inconsiderate, disrespectful, whiny, drunk, and entitled as F. And that's only accounting for when they're actually in the hotel. The phone calls that happen before the block dates are a whole other monster. People asking for ridiculous things. Can't you disassemble a queen bed in another room and put it back together in mine? Yelling about how I can't guarantee they'll all be right beside each other. Peed because the type of room they want isn't included in the block. All sorts of SH. It's a bridezilla convention and it wholly sucks. Explanation of wedding blocks for those who don't work in a hotel. When a wedding party wants to stay at a hotel, they have to make a block, which is a reservation made for a large group. It's usually the parents of either the bride or groom that sets it up. A short contract negotiated between the parents and the general manager. The contract lays out the dates of the wedding block, the type of rooms and how many of each type are needed, the cost of those rooms and the cutoff date. When that's set up, guests can call and make their reservations within the wedding block to get that negotiated price and one of the rooms that's been set aside. The cutoff date is selected by the parents. It's usually a week or so before the date of the block. When the date passes, the rooms in the block that haven't been taken yet are released back into our inventory, so they're available to other guests. The block reservation is closed out, which means that nobody else can make a reservation for that group. The contract states that after the cutoff date, if anyone attending the wedding wants to make a reservation, they have to make a regular reservation dependent on availability and pay the rack rate. Okay, the wedding is in mid-August. The parents of the brides made a contract that specified their cutoff date was July 4th, 2023. Weird because most people want a cutoff date that's about a week before the wedding. But okay. That's what they wanted. That's what they got. Sunday evening I got a call from a woman I'll call Jane. Jane says, hello, I need to make a reservation for the bride and groom wedding block that's in August. I've pulled the block up here, and it looks like the cutoff date is passed. I'm sorry. And just silence. Hello? Uh, you still there? Yeah, I'm here. I just don't know what you expect me to do with that information. It's not my problem. Well, obviously it effin' is. I can't add any reservations to a block after the cutoff date is reached. You'd have to book outside the block and pay the regular price if you want a room here. The regular price of a room that night would be $162 plus tax, compared to the block rate of $105 plus tax. Ugh, can't you just make me a reservation in that block anyway? I'm coming from Oregon. B, I don't care if you're coming from Narnia. No, I can't, I'm sorry. That's just how our system works. Do I have to call the parents? Oh no, not the parents. The ones who negotiated this contract and set the cutoff date you're whining about? If that's what you'd like to do, you can do that, sure. Fine, I will. And she hung up, huh? <laughs> not five minutes later, I get a call from the mother of the bride. I'll just refer to her as mom for brevity. Mom says, hi, I'm the mother of the bride, and I just got a call from Jane. She said you were refusing to give her the discount we negotiated for the wedding and that you wouldn't give her a room. I want to know why. Wow, I guess Jane is an effing drama queen, ha <laughs> Sure, the cutoff date is already passed and no further reservations can be added to the block after that date. Can't you just make an exception for her? She's coming from Oregon. So I've heard. No, I can't, I'm sorry. Well, we have a contract signed by John, the owner. Y'all, John is the general manager, ha <laughs> I understand. Let me just pull out the contract here. He signed it. Yep, I see it here. It's signed by John, the manager, and you. There's a bolded section that says all reservations must be made by July 4th, 2023. After this date, all unused rooms will be released back into the inventory, and any further reservations will have to be made outside of the block. I understand that reservations made after the cutoff date will be dependent on hotel availability, 
and will not receive the discount negotiated for the wedding. This is ridiculous. When is your manager in next? He'll be in tomorrow morning at 7 if you'd like to call back then to discuss the matter. I will be talking to him about this. Click, hung up on again. What a delightful group. 15 minutes later, someone else calls and says, So mom and Jane told me you're not making any more reservations for the wedding. Can't you make an exception for me? Hot D. Word gets around fast, I guess, huh? <laughs> Love how everyone is entitled enough to think that they're the one who will get the exception when I already told all their buddies there weren't any exceptions. I can't, sorry. Oh, well, thank you. Goodbye. Next day, mom does indeed call the manager, who tells her the same thing I told her the night before. <laughs> she was incensed. He again reminded her that she was the one who made the cutoff date. Jane called the front office manager to complain. Her excuse for not booking earlier was, I had to book my flight before I booked my hotel room. Uh, no, you didn't. Book the hotel room first. It's easier to fix a hotel room if your flight plans change than it is to fix a flight if your hotel plans change. So everyone was told no by the managers. I can't wait for the snotty reviews about how awful the front desk lady was about making the reservations for the wedding. Reading the reviews from entitled a-holes who didn't get their way? It's energizing. Morbidly hilarious. Love it, huh? <laughs> the lesson here? Don't be at me for following the rules that you made. The second story is... GM finally 86 awful regular who's been harassing me for six months. Exposition. I've been at this upscale, casual corporate restaurant for three years. Behind the bar there for 1.5 years there. Initially started bartending almost 10 years ago. The place had been around a little over two decades, and it's in an old money area. Much of the clientele is over 50, and have been going there since they opened. As you can imagine, that leads to a lot of very entitled regulars. It's annoying but altogether fine because the money is great, and I've worked my way to lead bartender with preferred schedule. There was one guy in particular, DH for D-Head, who used to spend a good amount of money, and had been doing so for at least 10 years. $150 to $300 tabs nearly every day of the week, with $50 to $100 tips every time. When I was training at this spot, they taught me that everyone would overpour his first drink. Double vodka on the rocks, but in a highball. He used the same glass all night, just topped with ice and a regular double pour after that, but it would still look full like we'd hooked it up. About six months ago, there were inventory issues. We were missing 14 bottles of our well vodka, what DH drank, and management said we can no longer free pour that vodka and must jigger. Guess who was the first person to serve DH after the rule was implemented? Drama begins here. After that, he's had it out for me. Before then, he'd been very friendly, though I always secretly despised him. He's racist, sexist, loud, obnoxious. But he started making comments like, OP, I love you as a person but hate you as a bartender. Every shift. I'd laugh it off, whatever, he's a drunk idiot. But the comments started getting worse. You're a terrible effing bartender. Isn't she a terrible effing bartender? Even when I wasn't around, he'd holler for anyone to hear. She's the worst effing bartender I've ever seen. I'm not. I get at least one guest compliment per shift on my speed and personality. But it still was hard to listen to every single day. I told management. GM gave him a talking to. DH didn't have to interact with me. He just needed to shut his mouth and let me do my job. He refused to order from me. He started blocking me from serving his buddies. I'd asked if they wanted another. He'd answer for them no, then immediately flag over my co-tender. He started blocking me from people nearby who didn't even come in with him. But he's so de-loud and imposing they'd just go with it. It made my co-workers' jobs harder. Because if they were stationed at the well making restaurant tickets, he'd interrupt them for service. All while ranting about how effing awful I am. Some guests started treating me poorly, simply because of his word. GM talked to him again. He stopped for a week, then went right back to his old ways. It's also worth noting that he stopped spending as much around the time the jigger rule went into effect. Significantly smaller tabs and tips as he stopped paying for all the people he'd paid for in years past. Which meant that those folks would take up to five bar stools for hours on end and get maybe two drinks each. So I was suffering this constant verbal assault and I wasn't making much money to show for it. I repeatedly told my GM. He repeatedly told DH to stop. The other managers were frustrated that nothing was really being done, as they'd all been witnessing the harassment. I let a couple of them know I was looking for other jobs. I guess they all finally told him that he needed to actually do something, because GM pulled DH aside again and told him he's got one more chance. DH didn't like that and stormed out before they even finished the conversation. A few days later, GM is on vacation. 
I went into my shift and another manager, A.B., for Awesome Boss, a very fair, respectful, no-nonsense man who I've always held in great esteem, told me that D.H. had been in earlier, but A.B. told him he needed to close out and leave as I was coming in, and G.M. had never finished their talk the other day. I was relieved I would be having a pleasant shift. 1.5 hours in, I turned around and who was there but effing D.H.? Immediate dread. He and a friend tried to call me over, clearly wasted. So I beeline to A.B., who also was immediately upset. So A.B. went to D.H. and told him we cannot serve him today, come back another time, and escorted him outside. Ten minutes later, he came back in yelling at me that I have his phone. Guess we're all staring. I calmly said that I did not, check with your friend, and went back to working. A.B. took D.H. outside once more. Not even five minutes after that, he was back in ranting to people about how effing terrible I am. Told me I don't know who his friends are. It's rumored he has ties with the mob. But as soon as he saw A.B. approach, he took himself outside. A.B. followed to tell him he's not welcome back. I did not witness this as I was working and they were outside. But I'm told D.H. started screaming and threatening A.B. as well. Then he started shoving A.B.'s chest and shoulders. Which is an absolutely stupid move because A.B. is effing built. A.B. said he was going to involve the authorities or kick his A. And D.H. finally dipped. A.B. and another brand new manager told me that evening while I closed that if G.M. did not ban D.H., that they would be putting in their resignations along with mine. A.B. met with G.M. the next morning at 6 a.m. to give him the story. I stayed up all night so I could be sure I'd be awake to call at 6.30 after their talk. G.M. assured me that D.H. would never be allowed back, and if he tried, they'd get a restraining order. I spent the whole next day in bed just drained and crying. It didn't feel real yet, and I didn't know why G.M. had let this continue for so long, or why I had for that matter. It's been almost a week now and I'm happy I stuck it out. I like this gig. But F, it's been a really difficult handful of months. The third story is, My company has no employees left. They all ran for the hills. For the past three months, I've worked at a small product testing lab that specializes in vitamins and supplements. Client companies send in samples of their products and we verify that they're not full of arsenic, lead, mercury, etc. I started in the prep lab preparing the samples, but last month I was moved to their wet chemistry lab, where they do a bunch of little side tests I've had to learn. There's also a microbiology department. When I started, there were 17 or so employees. Three weeks after I started, the sample load plummeted. Now each day we don't have enough for even eight hours of work when previously employees worked overtime to get results out on time. Shortly after, the chemistry manager, my boss, was fired. She had been no calling, no showing a lot, but when she did show up, she was often drunk. After she was gone, the semi-retired owner of the company came in and started making everyone in chemistry teach him how to do their jobs. His degree is in business, so he has no prior chemistry experience. He now runs the heavy metals testing, MS spectroscopy machine. Soon, three more people were fired, two from the front office and one from micro. Coincidence or not, they were all the company's only non-white employees. One had been there for nine years. People were upset. When I started, we had six employees in the chemistry department, including me. In all the drama, all three senior employees fled three weeks ago. Now, the chemistry department is composed of the company owner, an employee moved over from Micro, one loyal employee, a person who started two weeks ago and is leaving in January, a woman who's on her last week and me, who walked out on Friday putting in my two weeks notice. Excluding the owner, the most senior employee of that crew had been there for four months. The chemistry department is screwed. This company pays $18 an hour and requires a degree and provides abysmal benefits. There's never enough work for a full day. Yesterday, I finished all the samples I had an hour into my shift and read a book. The lab's already been cleaned three times over. The owner of the company walks around calling his employees kids, singing stupid songs about us, and giving us pointless tasks to distract us from the fact that all the clients are gone, along with telling us to violate our SOPs to get what little work we have out faster. There are no promotions to be had, and no raises for learning anything new. Just a yearly raise I've been told employees didn't actually get until they threatened to quit. It looks like I'll be going back to my previous job in animal welfare, but I'm not mad. The starting pay is less, but there's upward mobility, benefits, skills I want to know, and a fulfilling purpose. So dealing with dog is much better than this stupid lab. Hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. See you in the next video.